She died alone in her apartment four years ago after succumbing to the most evil disease, anorexia nervosa. Erin was a mere 11 years old when anorexia reared its ugly head. It began after she had contracted a common case of the flu. The flu was different than many in that she lost a noticeable amount of weight. After recovering sufficiently to return to school, I immediately noticed that something was not right. She not only did not regain the lost weight, but also, in fact, continued to lose. When encouraged to eat, she would report, it's not that I don't want to eat, no, I can't eat. Our once happy daughter, who had many friends, was no longer the Erin we knew. Erin's primary MD told us, Many doctor visits followed with little progress. Eventually, we were given a referral to the best eating disorder specialist in our city. Many more doctor visits followed before it was evident that inpatient hospitalization was necessary to treat Erin's eating disorder. Unfortunately, the only treatment available in our area was a general psych unit. Um, where no 11-year-old should witness what she was privy to of the older adolescents and teenagers. Years later, this experience she endured at such a young age was recognized as a source of PTSD, which resulted in treatment resistance. Despite the experience with the psych unit, somehow Erin and our family made it through grade school and through high school years. We made it through with the support of a continued and constant, constant vigilance with a team of treatment providers. Along the way, a handful of local inpatient admissions were required. Each time Erin would be discharged at a semi-healthy weight that would gradually fall lower and lower after leaving the hospital. As Erin grew older, she isolated herself more and found solace in running cross country and track. Ultimately, receiving a cross-country scholarship to Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee. Within five weeks of arriving in Nashville, things once again started to deteriorate. Erin did not pass the athletic physical. The recruiting coach had assured her she would. In addition, the coach instructed the other team members not to associate with Erin. She now had no athletic family and quickly became depressed. The university had nothing to put in place to counsel or support those with eating disorders. Our only choice was to have Erin drop out of school and be admitted once again for treatment. But where? Our treatment resources in our home state had not been successful thus far. We decided we need to search for an out-of-state pro provider. Sounds simple, right? Erin was losing weight fast, so now in crisis mode, we started calling throughout the country. The process of securing eating or disorder treatment is a daunting one. Where do you start? Neither the university nor our local physicians have the resources to advise us. So the internet became our vast resource. We began searching and calling for treatment centers as precious time to quickly away. Then we endured interviews by intake workers. We were interviewed, Erin was interviewed. Then Erin was put on a waiting list. My husband and I constantly worried about how we would keep our daughter alive until an opening appeared at our chosen residential treatment. Our local community had no medical expertise in the medical management of anorexia nervosa. This is a common problem to this day. Finally, we got the call that the bed was available at a treatment center. So off we went from Wisconsin to Arizona. Problem solved? In the beginning. Our daughter was thousands of miles away. How does the rest of our family survive, both emotionally and financially, with the daily crisis that appears when a child is in a life or death situation? We remortgaged our house asked for a leave of absence from work and hoped that one parent could stay in Wisconsin to keep the family afloat while the other handles the daily management of our daughter in Arizona. 
While we were now here heaving a sigh of relief that Aaron was in treatment, we were also unaware that anorexia nervosa is insipid, and this was only the start of 17 years of inpatient, outpatient, and back to inpatient treatment. We were always searching for the treatment that would last. At last count, Aaron had approximately 15 admissions, gaining well, weight while confined to treatment, and quickly losing upon discharge. Some providers who treated her never allowed Erin to achieve substantial weight for a long enough period for her to make lasting recovery. Health insurance was another full-time job as we proceeded through our nightmare. After admission to treatment, it was determined that insurance would not pay for out-of-state providers. But it appeared that eligibility depended on whom you spoke to at the insurance company. After many hours on the phone and eventually a lawsuit, it was determined that our insurance would cover out-of-network treatment at the same rate as in-network treatment, as well as an unlimited dollar amount. While resolving this issue, we paid out-of-pocket approximately $100,000. How many families would have the capability to do that? When our daughter reached the age of majority, another problem arose. The nature of this awful disease causes patients to deny the reality of the fatal consequences of the disease. It became evident that legal guardianship would be necessary to remain in communication with Aaron's health care providers. Aaron fought this in every possible way. One Wisconsin provider enacted a Chapter 51 state guardianship of our daughter then proceeded to look the other way while she was sent to a local academic hospital that had no eating disorder protocol for medical stabilization. The state of Wisconsin then tr transferred her to an affiliate hospital with, that, with a psych unit that, you guessed it, had no eating disorder specialists on staff. As this transfer of hospitals was occurring, I stepped in to advocate for our daughter, presenting our daughter elsewhere. We had the insurance coverage, and by this time, I had come to know many good out-of-state providers. The hospital chose to call security. While I calmly got on the phone to address the issue with her not-to-be-found manager, case manager, Event, evidently, this call was not happening fast enough as security arrived and in, indicated that they were going to call the county sheriff. My thought was, good, that'll take some time. <laughs> no. Anyway, no su such luck. The county sheriff arrived promptly and told me if I did not cooperate and allow the transfer, transfer I would be arrested. My reply was, go ahead, arrest me. This is my daughter's welfare we're talking about. At that point, the county sheriff produced a legal order that our daughter must be transferred. I had no choice but to follow the ambulance that would take Aaron to yet another disappointing treatment outcome. After that harrowing experience, we discovered that accurate legal information was very hard to obtain. It appears that each state has its own guardianship laws. At last count, we had obtained temporary guardianship in two states, which did not include the state where she died. All of this cost thousands of dollars in Aaron's life. In fact, Aaron's death, death was directly related to non-communication of her treatment team to each other and to us as her parents. It is our opinion that a uniform federal guardianship act is essential. Aaron's story only touches on some of the issues that surround the treatment of eating disorders. There is no wonder why the death rate is the highest of any mental biological illness. Our daughter never dieted or in any way knowingly precipitated the onset of anorexia nervosa. It appeared and took on a life of its own. The need for research dollars is evident, along with the federal policy to ensure every young man and woman that falls prey to this disease 
has every chance to just to recover. Our family began its journey through hell in 1993. Then, since then, we have met an extraordinary number of families fighting the same battle. There has been improvement on some fronts, but the death rate has not decreased. Families still lose their homes to finance treatment. Patients are degraded when providers dismiss them from treatment because their illness is too severe or not severe enough. And patients die alone as per document. It's time our federal government gave full approval to the Free Act. It is comprehensive, it is a comprehensive piece of legislation that is long overdue. It includes research, education, prevention, and treatment policy for eating disorders that has been well thought out. I was fortunate to be a part of the drafting of a precursor to the FREE Act, the Dream Bill to Address Eating Disorders in 2004. Please, I want to see a future for those like Aaron by making the FREE Act reality. It's 